Okay, members, you're all welcome to a meeting of the Justice Committee, and you're welcome to use your electronic devices if you can do the needful so that it doesn't interfere. That would be appreciated. Um, and if you're content, we will record the oral evidence sessions today by Hansard. And at this stage, if there's any declarations of interest, financial or otherwise, now is the time to declare it relating to any business of today. If not, then um, we will move on. Um, I don't think we have any apologies. Um, we've got Gemma, Emma and Sinead all joining us on the Starleaf facility and everybody else is here. So is there any delegation of votes, Christine? Yes, Gemma Dolan and Emma Rogan have delegated their votes to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon, in the event that the Starleaf connection is lost. Okay, thank you. Uh, draft minutes then of the meeting that were held on the 15th of October. If members are content that there are a true reflection of proceedings, then I'll sign them accordingly. Agreed. 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 A uh, couple of items and uh, under matters arising. There was additional written evidence received from the, the Dolce Vidi project. Uh, forgive me if I haven't pronounced that right. Um, but there's just some information in respect to parental alienation around the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. And that information was received after the committee report had uh, the committee report on the bill had been agreed and members are asked to, to note that information. Um, again, just to advise members that the organisation will be advised that the information has been provided to members. However, it's not included in the committee report on the bill as it was agreed before the information was received. The report does, however, cover the issue uh, that has been raised and the department has indicated that parental alienation could fall uh, within the domestic abuse offence, depending on the individual circumstances of the case. Uh, another item then, um, page 3 to 11 of your table pack, the Minister has adv uh, advised that she has taken the decision to recommence the COVID-19 Public Health Emergency Temporary Release Scheme for prisoners under the provisions of Rule 27 of the Prison and Young Offenders Centre rules. Um, the scheme had been paused in August. It provides for the early release of certain prisoners in the last three months of their sentence. And having consulted with the Director General of the Prison Service, the Minister has concluded that uh, recommencing the scheme is a proportionate measure at this time. Uh, the scheme will be subject to further review at the end of November. The Minister has also agreed to put in place a revised overtime payment scheme for prison staff during November and December, similarly to the uh, scheme that ran from March uh, to August of 2020. And this will be reviewed at the end of December, taking account of the situation uh, that, at the time, so members are asked to note the information in terms of the update from the minister. I don't intend to elaborate on it, but it's just for the purposes of the minute. I'm opposed to the decision that the minister has taken to recommence this scheme, um, and I made those comments previously, uh, so I'm not going to repeat them. But uh, I don't agree with the decision that she has taken on that particular issue. Um, in terms of the, the other item around counter-terrorism, the sentencing release bill, the Minister has responded to the Committee's request for confirmation that she intends to lay a memorandum before the Assembly explaining why an LCM is not being sought in relation to the counter-terrorism bill. Uh, the Minister has advised that she plans to lay a memorandum in accordance with the Assembly Standing Order 42A in order to ensure that other members of the Assembly have sight of her position and rationale. So, uh, members are asked to note that there is a letter been circulated round um, where I'm seeking clarity as to what the UK government intends to do in response to that. Um, so I think we're clearing that hopefully for issue later today once members are content with its contents. Um, and I would intend to revisit this when we get a response from the UK government um, indicating what they plan to do. Linda? That's the, the letter that the committee are going to take? Yeah. Yes, yeah. No, it's just us. It, no, it's, it's the factual one. Yeah, yeah no, that, that's fair. <laughs> so we'll, whenever we get a response to that, um, I think we we'll, may have further discussion on it. Okay, agenda item five. Sorry. Sorry. Back. Uh, yes, Mr. Free. Is there a time restriction on us or pressure on us with regards to waiting for that reply or that response and the actions of the minister? in laying that memorandum? memorandum. Was that was a question for Paul? Well, it, it's when the Westminster legislation gets laid, you see. So as Westminster proceeds with this, 
uh, LCMs need to be laid in a timely way in which it can then be reflected in Westminster's proceedings and the bill extended to cover the areas that it had wanted. Um, so what they're going to do now, that's a decision for them as to whether or not they're going to include Northern Ireland or not. Um, so I've no indication at this stage that there's a, a, a clock ticking in respect to it. Thank you. Okay. Item 5 then, the new legal framework for personal injury discount rate, a summary of the consultation response and proposed way forward. Um, and we're going to have an oral evidence session today on this. So we've got departmental officials um, attending via the Starley facility um, to provide an outline to the committee in respect of the consultation um, and the department's proposed way forward. So pages 122 to 175 of the meeting pack. And that includes a memo from the clerk, which you'll see on pages 125 and 126. And that uh, could be helpful to members in terms of some of the issues to consider. So hopefully I am in a position to welcome officials from the department. Once that comes up on my screen, yes, thank you. Um, so should have in the, in the room there, Lauren McAlpine, Deputy Director, Civil Justice Policy Division, Ms. Jane McGuire. Uh, Assistant Deputy Director, uh, Family Courts and Tribunals Justice Branch, and uh, Mr. Martin Muir, Head of uh, Branch Family Courts and Tribunals, all from DOJ. So you're all very welcome to the meeting. It'll be recorded by Hansard, a transcript of which will be published in due course. So, uh, Ms. McAlpine, I think I'm handing over to you at this stage. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Chairman, and to members of the committee for this opportunity to brief you on the Department's consultation on changing the framework for setting the personal injury discount rate. As our paper to the committee um, has indicated, the Minister has a conflict of interest uh, in relation to this matter on account of her husband's membership of a medical defence union. So the Permanent Secretary has taken the key policy decisions. So by way of background, uh, the discount rate is a percentage rate currently set at 2.5%, which is applied to just a lump sum award of damages for future losses and expenses in a personal injury case. And this adjustment is intended to reflect the amount that can be earned from investing the lump sum and is to give effect to the legal principle that an injured person should be fully compensated for their losses, but, but no more and no less. And this is known as the 100% rule. Although the rate is small in percentage terms, when applied to the uh, investment of a large personal injury award over many years, even um, more likely decades, it, it can equate to a very substantial sum of money. The power to prescribe the rate in Northern Ireland under the Damages Act sits with the Department of Justice after consultation with the Government Actuary and the Department of Finance. And the current basis for setting the rate um, is under the case of Wells and Wales, which effectively means setting it with reference to index linked guilts. Our recent consultation took into account concerns that this does not reflect how claimants are actually investing their damages and likely resulting in a discount rate which does not, in fact, give effect to the 100% rule. 28 responses were received to our consultation and are summarised in the summary of responses document, which I believe you have. That department, that document also sets out the department's conclusions about next steps. The key outcome is that we intend to seek executive agreement to bring forward a bill early in the new year to provide for a new statutory framework which will be very similar to the framework which applies in Scotland. This will involve setting the rate according to a, a notional portfolio of diversified low-risk investments with prescribed downward adjustments to take account of certain expenses and a further deduction, which might be called a, a margin of prudence, to guard against the risk of claimants being undercompensated. We believe that setting the, the notional portfolio and legislation offers upfront transparency and clarity. And the Scottish model also means that the rate will be set by the government actuary rather than by the minister. This reflects that 
once the principles and the, and the legal parameters are established in the legislation, setting the rate is really a, an actuarial rather than a political exercise. The other main feature of the new model will be a regular review at least every five years to ensure that the rate reflects market conditions while allowing uh, reasonable periods of stability in between. As well as consulting on a new legal framework, the department also undertook a review of the rate under the existing Wells and Wells framework and consulted the Government Actuary and the Department of Finance. We have considered that review very carefully and concluded that on balance it would be best not to proceed to change the rate at this time under the existing legal framework. This is in view of the decision to legislate for a new framework as soon as possible and under which a new rate would then be set. With this in mind, the Minister intends to ask for an accelerated passage for the Bill to set the new framework. So, uh, against that, that broad background, um, we're, we're happy to take any questions that the committee might have. Okay, thank you. Um, I suppose there's a, there's a couple of questions um, around the substance of what it is that we're, we're considering here. But can, to, if I can deal with the two procedural areas in the first point, the Minister's conflict of interest, and she's allocated the Permanent Secretary to take the policy decisions on this. How, how rare is it for a minister to remove themselves from taking policy decisions? Um, and is it the job of a permanent secretary who is accountable for how taxpayers' money is spent and implementing policy to be given this authority? Well, during the, the suspension of the Assembly, um, permanent secretaries did take certain decisions. But uh, as far as we are aware, when there is a minister in post, there has been no other case of a permanent secretary taking such decisions. Uh, the difficulty is that um, there's really no alternative because the minister does have uh, a very real conflict of interest and asking the permanent secretary to do this is the, the only um, plausible alternative. We did take um, legal advice on the issue and uh, from that, we understand there's no uh, legal obstacle to what um, is proposed. Okay, so herein lies, lies the question: who, who is going to come before this committee? Who's going to go into the assembly chamber if the minister has now had to abdicate her responsibility on this? Who's going to speak what on the that? minister's behalf? We don't see any difficulty with the Minister taking the bill through the Assembly because the policy decisions will have been taken uh, and framed in the legislation. I mean, and granted, she will have to speak to the bill in the Assembly, um, and those are policy decisions which will have been taken um, by the Permanent Secretary. And if there are any um, amendments or questions, we recognise there may be another role for the Permanent Secretary in, in dealing with those questions. But we don't see any difficulty with the minister standing up in the assembly and um, moving the bill. Would, would it not be the normal practice when you, uh, as assembly members, would do? You declare an interest, you identify what that conflict of interest is, and so long as that's well documented as to what it is, that then doesn't preclude you from actually taking decisions, so long as you're transparent in terms of revealing your interest. It seems strange to have now removed the minister from any policy decisions around this. I think the decisions which which could be taken would be um, so uh, advantageous to the medical or, or disadvantageous to the the medical defence union which the, the minister's husband belongs to that it, it really would be quite difficult for her. Um, to take those decisions, and she might be criticised for doing so. Okay, so in that, in that context, the consultation, the majority of responses disagree with your proposals to go down the, the Scottish model. Uh, I'm not commenting as to whether or not I support the Scottish model or not, but the department's then seeking accelerated passage. 
to take this through. So you have a minister declaring an interest and not taking the policy decisions. The permanent secretary is going to take those decisions and this committee is being asked to relinquish its scrutiny mechanism to have a consideration stage. Does that not strike the department as something that exposes itself to all levels of risks that wouldn't that shouldn't be necessary? And what's the justification for accelerated passage? Well, the, the, the department has a, a very ambitious legislative programme, and we're trying to get five bills through before the end of the mandate. Um, having decided to go for the Scottish model, the bill would be largely technical. I mean, that said, of course, we absolutely recognise that accelerated passage is very much against the norm, and we wouldn't be suggesting that, except that, that speeding up the legislative process will sooner remove the uncertainty around the discount rate which can only be to the advantage of claimants and defendants. And I know that colleagues who are, are in charge of the, the overall legislative programme have a concern that if we don't get accelerated passage for this bill, then we're likely to lose um, the, the miscellaneous provisions bill. Well, with the greatest respect, that's not the fault of this committee. Um, and we have a job to do. So I'm sure the committee will, will consider that as the justification for making the request for accelerated passage. Uh, I'm not sure it'll hold much water. Uh, in, in terms of the, the Scottish model, what, what are the levels of political accountability in that model when it comes to the striking of the rate? I think the main political accountability comes in the legislation which sets uh, the principles which are to apply governing the portfolio and in um, agreeing the portfolio on the face of the legislation and in respect of the deductions which are to be made. Once those decisions are, are made by the Assembly, uh, then it is really just for the government actually to apply them. It's also the case that before there is any review um, under the legislation, then the Scottish ministers in their jurisdiction are to satisfy themselves that the portfolio is still um, appropriate. Okay, I'll bring in some other members just at this stage. Um, Linda Dillon. So, in terms then of, of bringing this through accelerated passage, what exactly is the, is the Minister's biggest concern if, if we don't use accelerated passage? Is it, is it only the issue around the miscellaneous provisions bill? And then, I suppose, a, a question to both yourselves and the Chair and indeed the, the staff here. If we were not to give accelerated passage, how quickly could we do something? It, it's, it's a fairly tight piece of legislation with, a, I suppose, a small stakeholder group in one sense. I'm not saying that there's a large group of them, but they're mostly going to be coming at this from, from the one view. It's not, it's not something like the domestic abuse bill or stocking legislation. It's, it's quite different. So what kind of time frame could we do something like this in? And, and what is the main concern? Is it around the, the miscellaneous provisions bill? Because obviously, I mean, the members in this committee have concerns. We all want to see some of the things that we've been told are going to come through in that bill um, come before this committee and, and go through before this mandate ends. So, you know, we, we, are, we are considering it from both angles. We just need the, the best and most accurate information to make a decision on something around this because you've said it yourselves, accelerated passage is not the norm. It's not something we would want to do as a committee or to agree to. You know, we've just discussed LCMs. We don't like them either. Anything that doesn't allow us our role as as a scrutiny committee is not, is not a good way to go. However, based on the information, I suppose we can make the right decision. So I just would like a wee bit more information around that. Is that the only issue? Is it just around the miscellaneous yeah. provisions? The, 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 main, the main priority is to get the new legislation into place um, as soon as possible. And if we have accelerated passage, um, the plan would be to introduce the bill January, February, yeah. Royal Assent um, in September. If we don't have accelerated passage, then we might not be able to introduce the bill until September because the committee stages for this bill would then clash with 
committee stages for, for other bills, which are also in the pipeline. So, I mean, I would need to consult with colleagues in charge of the, the legislative programme. Um, and they seem to think the miscellaneous provisions bill would then fall off the end. But from my point of view, it's about um, getting the, the statutory discount rate onto the statute book as soon as possible. It is a technical bill. Um, it's about investment products and percentage of investment products and how um, percent, uh, percentage points should be expressed. And if it's not the government actuary doing it, it's a deputy government actuary. I, I'm not saying, of course, that there isn't room for the, the committee, obviously, to contribute to the bill, but, but we need to balance that against the desirability of, of getting the legislation into place um, as quickly as possible. Uh, and, and we don't underestimate at all you know, the, the implications of an accelerated passage and, and it reduces the role of the committee. I think before this could happen, the minister actually has to come to the committee um, and um, speak to the matter herself. But I mean, we have had some conversations before. That the, you're right, the committee has quite a, a heavy legislative um, timetable in this mandate. But I think that, that as a committee, that wouldn't preclude us from looking at other legislation or even from looking at a number of pieces of legislation at the same time. So, and I'm not saying that it's absolutely ruled out because I don't speak for the committee, but. I just, I'm still not absolutely clear as to why it has to be accelerated passage in order to get it onto the books quickly, because I agree with you, there, there may well be reasons that it has to get on the books quickly. I'm still not really clear on that either, why it absolutely has to be on the books quickly. So maybe, and you've said that you, you want it on as quickly as possible and that, you know, that's, that's the desire, but why? What 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 is the what is the, the imperative? Is what? Until um, claimants and defendants know what the statutory discount rate is going to be, it creates an awful lot of uncertainty for them, for their lawyers, uh, in trying to uh, settle cases because they, they, they don't know what the rate is going to be. Um, so until they know that, uh, cases will be delayed um, and may just back up in the court system. Uh, or they're trying to, to settle cases um, somewhere between the, the current prescribed rate and what they think the, might, the rate might be under the, the Scottish model. And we're really just very anxious to give claimants and defendants as much certainty as possible in order to allow I mean, those people who have suffered um, significant personal injuries uh, to have their claims disposed of and to get the compensation to which they are entitled just as quickly as possible. If, if we can't introduce it um, in January, February under the accelerated passage, it may be September before we can introduce it, which would push back Royal Assent until you know, early the, the following year, uh, which isn't, isn't desirable, we think, from um, the view of any parties to litigation. I'm going to, I'll, I'll bring in other members here, but I'm, I'm seriously struggling to understand how you can introduce this bill in January if you're going to get it through accelerated passage. So therefore, the legislation will be drafted, it can be introduced, but if we don't give you accelerated passage, you're then going to sit on it until September. Like it, it's not the department, with respect, it's not the department's job to tell this committee how it carries out its work. So there's no reason why the department can't allow us as a committee to manage these pressures. So you know, if, if, if you're saying that you have to wait for the miscellaneous provisions bill um, to be dealt with, that you can't then put through the accelerated passage, that's a decision by the department. It's not a procedural issue for this committee. It would be your, your department deciding that, not the committee. So explain to me why you can't allow us to do our job on the on, on this bill and, and you would need to sit on it until September. Who's took that decision? Well, we do have uh, an indicative programme for all five bills, which um, envisage the committee dealing with committee stages of bills sort of in a sequential manner. Um, if the committee is open to taking a committee stage of, of more than one bill, 
at a time then um, I expect colleagues will be willing to relook at the legislative programme. Uh, it's not that we will be waiting for the miscellaneous provisions bill before we introduce this. We think the miscellaneous provisions bill will will, will just not not be possible. Um, well, the department's planning to introduce the committal reform bill within the next couple of weeks. Subsequent to that, yeah. it's going to introduce the stocking bill. They're going to overlap. So it's not as though the department has decided, let's do committal reform and leave it for six months, and then we'll introduce the stocking. So the, the department has already decided to, to give this committee two bills. So I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to understand the, the justification for this request for accelerated passage. Um, and, and this debate around it is actually taking away from wanting to get into whether the Scottish model is the right one or not, because the majority of respondents have actually said that they don't believe that it is. Um, so I'll bring in Paul Frew. Yes, thank you. Um, it's, it's good to hear the officials concerned about the welfare of the committee with regards to our workload. Uh, but when you say that the bill would be technical in matter, does that mean that we wouldn't understand it? No, I'm sure that's not the case at all. You will understand it, um, or, or else it won't have been well drafted, which I, I'm sure won't be the case. Uh, it's just going to deal with technical issues, which we will all understand, but maybe, for example, uh, on the notional portfolio, there is a list of investment products uh, and how the, the percentage which a lumps lump sum should be invested in each of those products. So it's like 5% in gilts and 10% and in index linked gilts and 30% in overseas equities or something like that. I personally would not be able to contribute to a discussion on whether you know it shouldn't be 30% for overseas equities, it should be some other percentage. Um, okay, so I know this might be awkward for officials to talk in regards to the interest that the Minister has declared, but it seems to me, if I heard correctly, that the Minister's interests will be disadvantaged by this bill. So if that is the case, and that's what I heard, is this the Minister washing her hands of this bill? Well, she's not washing her hands of it at all, because she would be the person having to move it. Um, in the assembly and i'm not sure that i would agree that the, the bill is not in the interests of the medical defense union to which her husband belongs i think that group did prefer the the english and wales model um but uh, I, I think the fact that we are legislating to move away from the wells and wells model would by and large be seen as being in the interests of um, insurance companies and um, unions who support or provide insurance for, for private medical practitioners. You, you say that uh, the accelerated passage is because of one, it's a technical bill, and two, because of the time pressure and, of course, the workload of this committee, which is very commendable. But can I say, if the Permanent Secretary has moved this policy, what would what stopped the department? doing it over the last three years? Well, as soon as the uh, Assembly returned, um, we issued a consultation paper on uh, reviewing the rate under the, the current Wells and Wells um, model, but we, we couldn't um, really legislate for uh, a new um, framework uh, in the absence of an Assembly. We were working uh, with MOJ and, and, and Scottish departments over a number of years prior to this and what to do uh, about the, the statutory discount rate. So it wasn't as if we just suddenly picked it up um, in January or February, but we felt there was uh, only so far that we could take this uh, without a minister. The, the divergence in early rates has been a subject of discussion for many years. I can recall the last Justice Committee dealing with it, and I can remember PAC reports 
on it with regards to managing legal aid. I think that was way back in 2016. But yet, here we are in 2020, and now you're asking for accelerated passage. Does it not seem strange to you that we would um, be asked to do this so quickly? I, I'm not sure. In fact, I'm, I'm quite sure the statutory discount rate doesn't have any bearing on, on legal aid. Um, this is a... So, so with regards to the sequence of bills that the department has, not the committee, can I, can I offer, speaking not on behalf of the committee, but giving you some reassurance that this committee and its members are quite thorough, are quite professional at what we do, and it has a staff that is top-notch and on top of their game. And we will accept as many bills as you could throw at us in the time left to us in this term. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, Doug Beattie. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, and thank you for answering these questions. I, I, I guess, you know, by just the questions that are coming at you, you can see how this is not just a technical bill, um, but it is a complex bill. Um, and I just want to, to – I don't know if you did answer this, and, and apologies if you did, but I just want to, to, to raise something that the Chair raised, and that is that the, the majority of the respondents said they preferred the English and Welsh model. So why did you then say, no, we're going to go with the Scottish model? What was the rationale behind that? Well, I mean, the consultation isn't, I'm sure the committee will agree, just, just a numbers game. I think most importantly that the principles in the, the English and Scottish legislation are very similar. And they both assume that a, a claimant will invest in a diversified mix of low risk investments. And both models are consistent with um, the principle of, of achieving 100% compensation, ensuring that money is available to meet expenses as they arise and, and that it will be exhausted at the end of the period of the award. In Scotland, though, those principles are discharged on the face of the legislation, which prescribes in a table in the notional portfolio the investments that a claimant is presumed to make and the prescribed deductions that are to be made. And then the rate is then set on that basis by the government actuary. In England and Wales, it's for the Lord Chancellor to set the rate, taking these principles into account. And on the advice of a panel of experts whom he is to appoint, he's also to have regard to the actual investments being made by claimants and make allowances for expenses such as he thinks appropriate. So, I would have thought that the English model is just that little bit more opaque than the Scottish model. Um, if we legislate, if the Assembly legislates to describe um, the notional portfolio, then everyone knows what they're dealing with up front, uh, and that will be a role for the legislature. Um, the legislature will also determine the deductions that are to be made rather than those, as would be the case under the English model, something for the Minister to take into account just on the advice of a panel of experts. And I have to say, um, in 2015, I think it was, the Ministry of Justice commissioned a panel of experts to look at um, issues around the statutory discount rate, and they couldn't reach a consensus. So the role for the panel of experts in England and Wales, even under their own model, is untested as yet. I think we should have confidence in the government actuary to carry out this role and for him to carry out the role on the basis of the legislation which the Assembly will have put in place. Uh, and that's a fair one, and, and, and you're absolutely right. Um, consultations are not about numbers, but it's important enough to, to be in the consultation and ask the question in the first place. Uh, and if it wasn't, it wouldn't be in there. So can I just ask then, I, I mean, a lot of this is about what is the projected cost to the public purse. Do we know what the projected cost to the public purse difference would be between staying as we are in the Wales and Wales model or adopting the English and Welsh model or adopting the Scottish model? But is there, is there a projected cost to the public purse to either of these? It's almost impossible to give a projected cost for it because that would require us to know 
the value of all personal injury claims which are currently uh, pending against all government departments and trusts and what is the pecuniary loss element of that claim and what is the anticipated lifespan of the claimant. It's only when you have that information that you know uh, what figure you're applying the statutory discount rate to and we haven't gone to trusts to say tell us um, all of the, the, the claims pending against you or, or to any other government department saying well what are, what are the value of all the claims pending against you. In broad terms we can say I mean Wales and Wales is currently um, at 2.5 percent. Uh, if we applied that rate now it would go down to minus 1.75 maybe minus 2 um, and that would be very significantly more expensive for the health service and for insurers. But this um, isn't really about cost, it's about fairness to both defendants and claimants and what is the right model in order to ensure 100% compensation rule. Yeah, and, and, and again, you, you, again you're, you're absolutely right. and. and it is about the claimants and making sure they get 100%, but, but there is a cost to the public person one way or another. And where you cannot look to the future, you can look back to get a, a, an understanding of what that would be. So the modelling you would take from the previous years to have a better understanding of what the difference would be in staying where we are now to what the difference would be if we adopted the Scottish model. And, and I guess the reason I'm asking questions like that, even though it's a pretty broad brush question and it's not pointed, because that goes into this part about accelerated passage. There are so many questions that need to be asked and for us to winkle out that uh, I'm sitting here at this moment in time and I don't even know the right question to ask. I need to be able to delve into this more to understand the very nature of the questions I need to be uh, asking. Um, I mean, I think this is an incredibly important bill um, going on in the future, and therefore, I'm in no doubt it, it does need the scrutiny that this um, committee will give it. So that's my concern, is that I just think we need to dig into this a little bit more than, than we are at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, Rachel Woods, and then I'll bring in Sinead Bradley. <laughs> not, not sure where that's coming from. Fire alarm. Fire alarm. Investigate. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I don't want you being stuck in the building if you need to vacate it. This committee is very important. <laughs> Somebody save him. So what's your actions on the fire? Well, we just go investigate. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> uh, you're okay. Conspiracy theory. Because <laughs> we were asking too many questions. <laughs> Always yeah, we, we 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 can we can move on to our next uh, part of the agenda. So we'll this committee staff will get in touch and see if we can get this started again in the next half hour, hopefully or hour. I can't hear what you say. Keep safe. Okay, take care. Okay, members. If the broadcasting folks can cancel that, thank you. Keep safe. Sorry about that, members. Um, one of those things, when something happens, and hopefully there isn't. The hopefully there isn't actually a genuine no, problem. Hopefully not. Fair hopefully not. So. Yeah. Um, but there's maybe some more questions. Mem members are going to want to tease out with them on. I know today the committee is going to be asked to give a view as to whether or not we support accelerated passage, and um, so members are going to need to come to a view on that. I'm clear on my view based upon the answers that I've got um, as to, to how we should be dealing with this. But maybe rather than going over that, we'll, we, we'll, we'll move into the next evidence session straight away just, and then we'll come back to this, hopefully, if, if we can recommence it. Apologies, Sinead, I know you had been trying to get in there, but I'll, I'll come back to this item, and we'll just move straight into item six to, to keep things moving. Hopefully they're here. Yeah. So members, just as, as officials are taking their place, this is 
around simplifying the legal aid approval process for engagement of expert witnesses and family proceedings in the magistrate courts, and it's a summary of consultation responses and proposed way forward. So the department um, is here today to outline the results of the consultation on a proposed uh, pilot scheme that will allow psychiatrists and psychologists to be instructed in public law proceedings in the family proceedings court without having to get prior authority from the legal services agency. Uh, provided they work within a fixed hourly rate and within a certain number of hours and the Department's proposed way forward. So the relevant uh, papers are at pages 177 through to 234. So can I welcome um, Stephen um, Martin, Deputy Director of Enabling Access uh, to Justice Division in the Department of Justice, and uh, John Bradley, Head of the Branch, Civil Legal Aid Reform Branch within DOJ to the meeting. You're both very welcome. It will be recorded by Hansard, a transcript of which published in due course. So, Mr Martin, I think I'm going to hand over to you at this stage. Great. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today um, to brief the committee on the consultation um, on improving the way expert witnesses are appointed in public family law cases in the Family Proceedings Court. Um, public family law cases involve important decisions about the care and welfare of children deemed by social services to be at potential risk of harm. Expert psychologists and psychiatrists are used in around 20 per cent of cases in the Family Proceedings Court. Um, and the purpose of the changes we are looking to introduce are about, firstly, reducing potential delay in these important proceedings by streamlining the approach for appointing experts, and secondly, improving transparency and value for money by standardising the amounts experts are paid. The changes we propose to make are based on the be best available evidence and we, we will plan to test the approach in a year-long pilot. If this is, this is successful, we will look for opportunities to roll out similar approaches to other types of experts used in other types of cases. The pilot will also be used to iron out any operational issues that arise and create a sustainable operational model that can be used more widely within the Legal Services Agency in terms of other expert appointments. The consultation was well received and additional evidence came to the fore, which has helped to shape our final proposals. These are set out in the post-consultation report. There are, there are areas that have changed as a result of the consultation, and those are set out in the briefing note. The two main changes relate to the hourly rate for psychologists and the cap on hours within the general authority. So, In terms of the next steps, our plan is to launch the pilot for a year from the 1st of January and to return to the committee early in 2022 with an evaluation report and an outline of our next steps. I hope this, this short briefing chair has been helpful, and we look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you. Um, Sinead, you have your hand up. I'm not sure if it's to come in on this. No, it's from a previous one. That's okay. No problem. Um, Linda Dillon. That's an excellent briefing. If only the could all be as, as, <laughs> as, as succinct as that. Um, first of all, I suppose to say, we as party didn't respond to the consultation simply because we wanted to see what the the interested bodies and those who understood this this best would would what their responses would be, and then we could, I suppose, take a position from that. Just a, a couple of of small questions. The first one is just in relation to that change. Why why was there a distinction between psychiatrists and psychologists in the first place? So. I suppose I'm just trying to reassure myself that it wasn't a case of a lot of psychologists saying we should be getting the same as them, and, and, and I'm, yes. I'm fairly certain that's not going to be the case. Um, and then just following the conclusion of the consultation, have, G, have DOJ worked with any practitioners in relation to working out the, the new time cap? And around the exceptional circumstances, you know, to consider specialisms. What will it mean in practice? You know, what will it mean in practice? What what are specialisms? I suppose, and, and is is my, que my my main question there? I mean, to me, this looks good, obviously, and I think even the fact that obviously this will mean a reduction for some people mm. in their hourly rate. But a hundred pound an hour is a substantial rate. Yes, absolutely. And I think anybody. In that field, that's really interested in what they're doing, really cares about what they're doing in terms of family courts. Will be will be more than content to be getting a hundred pound an hour. Um, so, I mean, I, I do think that it, it is hopefully going to be a positive move, and I do think even the, 
you know, having this as a pilot and looking to it then as to how it can be rolled out because it's one of the issues that I always have, you know, pilot, 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 but never any plan to roll it out. So a plan to roll it out for me is is, is one of the, the vital elements of this. So I, I would suppose congratulate you on that okay. element of it as well. But just those few wee questions. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, perhaps if I start and then John can, can pick up. Yeah. So in terms of your, your first question, we struck the original rates um, because we looked at the NHS um, salaries for consultant psychiatrists and uh, consultant psychologists, um, and therefore we struck the 90 and the 100. But actually the evidence that came back was that we'd, we'd forgotten about certain things uh, in terms of psychologists, so we hadn't taken some things into account. Uh, and there was also an issue about the rates that they were currently getting were, were perhaps significantly higher, so many of them would not have been ever working for that, that kind of rate. So that's why we, we came from the 90 to the, to the 100. Um, and it's broadly in line with what is in place in neighbouring jurisdictions. So we felt that was probably a, a fairer rate and more likely to get um, a good body of psychologists that would be prepared to do that, do that work. Um, in terms then of the, um, the, 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 the time allowed then, John, and the, and, and the other point around the exceptional circumstances, do you want to cover those? Uh, yes. Um, one of the things that's been beneficial for us in terms of focusing this pilot narrowly on psychologists and psychiatrists it has it enabled us to work closely with professionals in the field so to go and talk directly to the people who are involved in in producing these reports for us and to get a much richer understanding of the work that's typically involved in meeting with with the people involved in the cases conducting psychological assessments uh, and and report writing and the other work that goes into the compilation of a report so we've been able to construct uh, a, a cap on the hours that fully takes into account what we've been told from from people working in the field uh, reflects the, their 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 real life experience of, of of conducting these cases, with both the cap and with uh, with both the hourly rate and the cap on the number of hours. What we've done is pitch it at a level which we believe will cover a reasonable number of the cases to make the standardisation process worthwhile. But that is that has some degree of conservatism built in, um, and the intention will be to test how that works in operation through this pilot phase. What we're not going to do is launch it, run it for a year, and then look back at the end and see what happens. Uh, we've, we've built uh, an evaluation system that will give us real-time live information on what sorts of applications are coming in for these certificates, how they're being assessed by the agency, and what, what, what that's resulting in in terms of outcomes, in terms of the case, whether they're running more quickly or what have you on a live basis we'll look at it we've 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 timetabled ourselves to look at it every three months during the 12 month period but we'll also get live reports should any issue, issues emerge during that time uh, in terms of the the test for uh, going beyond the cap or going beyond the hourly rate um, we had representation that there are occasions where perhaps especially in respect of psychiatrists, but to some degree also in respect of psychologists, where the issues that the children or the family are facing are so particular or so specialised that there are very few people um, who, who have the necessary expertise and the necessary experience to provide those reports. And in those circumstances, it can be necessary to, to increase the rate that's available to attract those people uh, and to do it. Um, we're working with the Legal Services Agency currently so that they'll have a robust mechanism for identifying where, where, that, where those criteria are met um, and to ensure that, that we don't provide a barrier to the appointment of the necessary expert, but also that we don't create so many exceptions that it, that it undermines the purpose of, of, the, of the general authority in the first place. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Linda. Rachel Wood. Thank you. Um, I just have a few questions on this. Um, in terms of just following on from Linda's question about specialism, um, say there about flexibility um, in terms of the pay, but is there flexibility in terms of the hours then as well, if it's a specialist case? Yes, indeed. So, uh, the, as I say, the, the cap on hours uh, that we've set, it's different for psychologists and psychiatrists, and it's based on our understanding based on conversations with the two professions about the work that's typically involved in, in the sorts of reports that are seen at this level um, there is some variability within that some of the variability comes from reading time so if there's a great deal of documentary material that the experts got to read before they can produce their report that can have an effect on the hours and we've set the reading time therefore outside of the cap 
So the, the cap on hours is for work done directly with assessing uh, 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 clients and, and for report writing. The reading time is, is set separately from that, and so we shouldn't, shouldn't give rise to, to a need for large numbers of prior authorities. But there will be times when perhaps there are a large number of children, perhaps there are children with complex needs, perhaps other prevailing circumstances dictate more work is required, and the, there will again be flexibility around that. And we're working with the LSA just to identify the correct criteria that will apply in those circumstances too. Um, in terms of judging whether or not this pilot has been a success, what do you mean by success? Yes, we, we've got what we're trying to do for all of our projects is set out very clear evaluation criteria at the start. So, two main benefits we're trying to achieve are reducing delay in um, these proceedings because they involve the future care of children. So, the, the, the quicker decisions can be made, the better it is for the children. Um, so, that's a key criteria. And then there's another set of key criteria around value for money. So the evaluation criteria we've, we've developed are really based around those two things. Um, and then there's a third, I suppose, around operational issues, how it operates in terms of uh, the legal services agency and the checking regime and, and, and the information generation and that kind of thing. But for each of our projects now, we've, we're trying to have quite a clear set of evaluation criteria clearly linked to the benefits that we're trying to achieve. Um, and just in terms of the hourly rate, you'd said that it's broadly in line with other jurisdictions. Do you happen to have the actual rates in the other jurisdictions? Uh, I think off the top of my head, I think in England and Wales, it's £94 an hour for psychologists and 108 for psychiatrists. So it's, we're, we're broadly in the, in, in the same ballpark. Um, finally, just in terms of the respondents, obviously they... Um, the proposals have been changed since there was consultation. Have you gone back to the respondents to detail the proposed changes? That's what we're, we're hoping to do. I should have said that at the start. Hoping to do after this session is to publish the post-consultation report, including any comments that the, the committee wish to make in that. Um, and, and then that will, will let um, consultees know what, what our, our, our plans are and our next steps. Okay, thank you. Emma Rogan and then Gordon Dunn. So I'll bring Emma in just for the next question. Thank you, Emma. Thanks, Chair. Um, look, thanks for the presentation um, this afternoon. Um, obviously, saving money and, and value for money, as you said, is, is a positive thing. But can the department give us assurances that these new hourly rates and time caps will not have a negative impact on um, those vulnerable witnesses that are, are, are mainly children who are in receipt of legal aid and considering that the um, estimated annual saving is 23,000, it's not that high? Yeah, it's 23,000 out of a, of a spend of about 150. Um, so it's, it's a fairly <coughs> large proportion, but I take your point. I mean, that's one of the things that we're going to be looking at. And as John said, we're not just going to leave the evaluation to the end. We're going to have real-time information. So, if, if for example, we find that we can't get expert witnesses appointed at those rates, then there's an opportunity to intervene earlier. But we think, based on best available evidence, that there should be a, a good proportion of experts who are prepared to work for for that level. And in criminal cases, um, the, the the rate is 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 100 pounds an hour for psychologists and psychiatrists. So we're reasonably confident there will be a good pool. But as I said, we've got the ability to to, um, to act before the, the end of the year if, if we find there are particular problems. Might be just worth mentioning as well, Stephen. Part of the evaluation methodology will involve not just gathering data through applications and so forth through the LSA, but we're also going to look to gather qualitative information from people involved directly in the running of these cases. So from the from the uh, the the. the, uh, the judges in the FPC court, from, uh, from uh, uh, members of the family bar, from solicitors involved in these cases, and from, from Nigala and others, uh, on how, if at all, this is affecting the, the operation of, of, of the courts and, and therefore how it's affecting the children involved. So we won't be sitting in a civil service office looking at numbers of applications coming in and judging success purely in those terms. We'll also look as best we can at the, at the impact on, on, as you say, the children and families who are, after all, at the centre of, of these proceedings. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Emma. Um, Gordon Dunn. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, gentlemen, for your information. Um, would it be fair to assume that a report will cost roughly £2,200 
If you take uh, eight hours for assessment, eight hours for writing, say two, uh, and say two children, you're up to 2,200, roughly. Would that be the average cost? That's, that's, not, that's not unreasonable. Yeah. And what about witnesses going, if it's to go to court or go um, to other hearings, what sort of rate are they on then, the expert witnesses? Oh, so there are the, if the expert witness is called as a witness yeah. in the yeah. courtroom, I think the uh, typical rates are something like five hundred pounds a day, or two hundred and fifty pounds for a half day, is is uh, is roughly the, the sort of fees and payment. You're not sure on it. I have the precise figure in front of me. I can I can yeah. get back yeah. to the with that. Um, no, but I think it's, that's, it's, that's that's the figure. It, at the at the moment, it's a little bit. Um, it's a mixed picture. But what we're moving to is a standard fee of two hundred and fifty pounds for half a day and five hundred pounds for for a full day. So that's that's the fee that they would get if they had to appear. In many instances, they don't have to appear um, because their report is sufficient. And talking to to some of the family judges, they're very keen that those reports are kept um, focused and a little less lengthy. So they won't necessarily always need to be called. But if they are, that those are the rates: two fifty half a day and five hundred for a full day. Yeah. Okay, chair. Just. Um, following on that, the Northern Ireland Audit Office Report 2016 put quite a bit of an emphasis on the use of expert witnesses and the need for reform. Is this part of that, or uh, have we not really tackled all of, of those issues? It mentioned in the report uh, of 2016 there is no set fee structure for this type of work. Fees payable under the General Authority have not been reviewed since 1992 and have an upper limit of £120 per hour. And it talked about, we've examined a number of legal aid case files and found that different experts charge different rates for reading uh, and constructing reports. Yes, so um, this project is part of that reform. On the criminal side, their standard fees have been in place for some time um, and it's £100 an hour for these experts in, in, the, in, the, in criminal proceedings. Um, on the civil side, there are a much wider range of experts used, and some of them not, not very often. Um, so engineers, for example, in road traffic accident cases and so on. Um, so this is the first part of, of our, our reform on the civil side. Now, there have been changes since that report in terms of how the Legal Services Agency operate expert witnesses and the controls that they put in place. But in terms of changing the policy on the, on the civil side, this is... This is at the project that we're hoping that will will initiate that that change, um, and if successful, then we would hope to roll that out to a wider range of experts right across um, the civil law. Is there general support within the the legal world to to progress this? Um, I mean, we got quite a, a positive response to this consultation, and I think in large part because people see it as as addressing delay. I think as long as, uh, um, I think Emma Rogan's point was a really important one, I think as long as whatever we do does not add to the, the length of time taken in cases, we'll have support from the legal profession. Um, and I think the consultation was well received because it was genuinely open and transparent and we engaged with the right people. So I think as long as we take those principles forward into the, any further reform, then I think it will be, will be reasonably well supported. But it is important that the public out there are assured that Legal aid is under control, and you know I, I know there's been some effort made, and I believe the total expenditure has been reduced. Are you aware of, of the, the last year's spending on legal aid? Can you verify it? Yes, the the, the nineteen twenty year the audited accounts haven't yet been uh, produced, and the the controller and auditor general is currently completing his audit. So I don't have that figure. The the, the report will be published, I believe, by the fifteenth of November. And that will have the 1920 figure. The figure for 1819, um, I think, was 84 million in terms of legal aid. There's about three, three and a half million of that is on expert fees right across all of the types of cases, criminal and civil. So you've given us assurance that there is an increase in confidence in, in control of legal aid? Um, I mean, I, there, there definitely is. We're in a much stronger position than we were in 2016, and I think one of the things this particular consultation has benefited from is the introduction of the legal aid management system, because pre the, 
the, the introduction That's of that. That's an IT-based system? It's an IT system. It's a case management system. Um, and that is giving us much richer information um, to develop our, our policy from. And it's giving the LSA much better um, information and uh, a system to, to manage cases. So that certainly has been a major, um, a major improvement. OK, thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. OK, thank you, Gordon. Members, any other questions? No, OK, Can, to, just to finish on this, um, Stephen, I know this deals with some of the experts, but obviously there was the PSA, PAC recommendations back in 2016 regarding all of the, yes. the experts. Are you able just to update us in the context of this, where the department's at, and addressing that report? Yes, so in terms of that report overall, Chair, um, progress has been made in a number of recommendations. So we, we will be producing a, a we'll be briefing you um, through a written briefing in November around the statutory registration scheme and the contracting re uh, review scoping study. Um, we'll give you an update on that. On, in terms of remuneration reform, I think we're in a reasonably good place. Um, we're taking forward, in fact, John is leading in this project, um, standardisation of family fees. Um, and we are currently in the research phase. We've rescoped that project and narrowed the scope. I'm very happy to give you a briefing about that, at, at perhaps post that, that research phase. Um, and we are um, doing further work then in terms of the Crown Court review that was done in, in, in 2016. We're doing a further review. Uh, and that was the, uh, the review that led to the, the legal aid strike. Um, so we're, we're looking back, back at that and seeing if we can um, you know, sort of develop further improvements. So, there's a lot of work to do, Chair, but yeah. we're not in a bad place now, um, and, and we're, we're, we've certainly got that, that work well planned uh, and, and are focusing our resources as best we can to address those priorities. Okay. And I know probably for members of the public, they'll look at these rates of fees and think this is incredibly high. You know, I understand the context, though, in which you're operating and professional people, and, and you need to be able to strike a rate that actually gets what you need. I suppose from from public perspective is whenever you commission for expert advice, that that decision to commission it is a robust assessment before you decide to actually engage an expert. So it's kind of a separate issue. You have to pay the rate that's going to attract the experts, but we need to ensure that there's a robust decision making before you commission what some will regard as very expensive expert fees. Absolutely, Chair. And, and we, we aren't involved in the decision as to whether an expert is needed. That's an issue for the judge. But talking to some of the senior family judges, they're very keen only to use experts where experts are absolutely needed. In these cases, because we're really engaging human rights in terms of the right to family life and the future of, of children, there will be cases where experts are absolutely needed. Um, but I know the judiciary are very, very keen to make sure that experts are only used when they're, when they're absolutely required. Okay. No, thank you for that. Okay, members, then, if you're content, then we can thank both of you for, for coming to the committee today. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, okay, members, so if no. members are, are content, then, with the department's proposals, that the revised general authority will take effect from the 1st of January 2021. It will be a year-long pilot, and we can then indicate as such, unless there is any more information members need, then we will proceed with that course. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, I'm going to keep going through the item, uh, the, the rest of the paper. The officials, as I understand it, um, are making their way up to Parliament buildings and will be joining us. Um, but because of the procedures, th there will need to be a short recess to clean the surfaces before they actually come in to the room, just to keep ourselves right. So I'm going to move through, though, and try and get, I'm going to complete the rest of the paper before we uh, go back to that item. So item number seven is around the maximum number of judges. So it's pages 236 to 240. The department proposes to make a stat rule under the powers conferred to it through the relevant uh, legislation. This will increase the statutory limit on the number of High Court judges from 10 to 15. This will allow future appointment of part-time judges, uh, which may add to the pool of applicants and potentially increase diversity at that tier. It will also allow headroom for the addition of judges required due to unforeseen pressures. Uh, the President of the Historical Institutional Abuse Redress Board and the Victims Payment Board, for example, are all members of the High Court bench. 
um, which has decreased the number of judges uh, to deal with High Court business. The Department has advised that the change to the statutory limit uh, would be cost neutral and that individual business cases will be required to increase the actual complement from the current limit of 10, taking account of the overall volume of High Court business while ensuring that funding is available for the additional salaries and uh, pensions. The Department intends to lay the regulations as soon as possible with the aim of having provision in place by December 2020. Uh, the statutory rule will be subject to the affirmative resolution uh, procedure. So, Members, if we are able to indicate uh, that we are content with the proposed statutory uh, rule, then um, we can proceed on that basis. Members are content. Right. <clears throat> Item 8. The Chemicals, Health, Safety and Genetically Modified Organisms um, Regulations 2020. At our meeting on 1 October, the committee noted that the Speaker had written all chairs providing a copy of a letter from FMDFM, which included the uh, Northern Ireland Civil Service Administrative Guidance for EU Exit Transition Period Statutory in Instruments. Members were advised that further information regarding the role of committees in relation to SIs would be provided by committee staff. The paper has been provided on pages 242 to 244. Uh, of your meeting pack. Um, it notes that unless a parent act uh, makes specific provision in relation to the Assembly, uh, statutory instruments will not be subject to Assembly procedures, even where they relate to devolved matters. Scrutiny of a statutory instrument is a matter for Westminster. However, UK Government Ministers will not normally make uh, statutory instruments uh, relating to devolved matters without the agreement of the relevant Northern Ireland Minister, and where the Minister proposes agreement, it is appropriate that the Department engages with their committee. The committee should consider if the proposed change is necessary, and if so, why the statutory instrument is the appropriate legislative vehicle rather than a statutory rule, which would be subject to Assembly proceedings. The uh, guidance explains that a high volume of EU exit legislation is required before the end of transition period, and it indicates departments may wish to engage early with their committees, agreeing an approach to consideration of each SI. There will be varying levels of enge engagement depending on whether the SIs address minor technical issues, more substantive technical issues, uh, and or minor policy changes, or indeed more substantive policy changes. Uh, there are two SIs on the agenda for the consideration of this committee today that the Minister proposes to agree or has agreed, both of which the Department has described as being technical in nature. Uh, the letter for the first SI was only provided to the committee two days prior to being laid in Westminster. The second was provided six days before it was laid. So, If members are content, we are going to ask the Department uh, why the committee um, could not be notified sooner when the Minister proposes to agree a request. Uh, that a UK government is taking forward an SI that relates to a devolved matter, and to clarify how many SIs relating to EU exit are anticipated for justice-related matters, and whether these are expected to be technical amendments or if they cover more substantive changes. If members are content, first of all, with that, we will raise that issue. Um, and then I'm just going to highlight what the two SIs are that we've got today. But Linda, you wanted to come in there. Sorry, I sure of the same issue, obviously, with the SIs, I have with the LCMs, and anything else that removes our ability to scrutinise legislation that impacts here. I, I don't like it, um, to say the least. I agree that the, the time in which this has come is very short, and, and I would like clarity because I'd like the clarity is that does that fault lie with the department or does that fault lie with the British government? Because we're in, in such time constraints as is that where where this has come from, so I, I agree okay. with, with asking those questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, so in terms of the the first two of the SIs on the agenda today, um, the chemicals, health and safety, and genetically modified organisms um, regulations 2020. This SI will reverse amendments that were made. Um, by the Chemicals and Genetically Modified Organisms Regulations 2016 uh, to ensure Northern Ireland's continued alignment with EU law in accordance with Annex 2 of the Northern Ireland Protocol. The Department has advised that the amendments are minor, they are technical in nature, and do not represent changes in policy or place an additional burden on industry. And It was considered practical to allow the Health and Safety Executive in Great Britain to take this forward, so the SI was led in Westminster on the 15th of October. So uh, I think notwithstanding Linda Dillon's comments, which I would agree with, um, and we'll put that on record, 
that we are content to note the position in respect of this SI, um, but indicate that we're not happy with the, the time frame um, and we want an explanation as to, to why we were given such late notice in respect of it. So members content then that we note this SI. Content then um, law enforcement and security amendment regulations, the second of the SIs, um, this will reverse amendments to the Firearms Northern Ireland Order 2004, which were taken forward by the Home Office in the UK-wide Law Enforcement and Security uh, Regulations 2019. It ensures that Northern Ireland remains in alignment with the Weapons Directive, which allows for the retention of the European Firearms Pass. It will also ensure that no deal amendments to Commission implementing regulation um, will not extend to Northern Ireland, so that the regulatory framework will remain compliant with the Weapons Directive as required by the Northern Ireland Protocol. The Department has advised that the amendments do not represent any change in policy, but reverse no deal amendments, and it is proposed that the SI is being laid in Westminster today. So again, um, members are content then that we will note this SI subject to the same comments around the length of time that we were given due notice of. Members content. Right. Item 10, um, Community Safety Board, the Framework Overview. It is a written briefing paper and it is from the Multi-Agency Community Safety Board and Framework, which aims to link the strategic and operational uh, response to community safety issues and embed and build on the strategic direction of travel provided for by the 2012-17 uh, Community Safety Strategy for Northern Ireland. The framework, the terms of reference for the board, and a diagram illustrating how the Community Safety Board fits with the PSNI vision for community safety are all included in your meeting papers. The Community Safety Board has agreed to focus its work along the three broad themes of people, place, and powers, including best practice and performance. So, if members are content to note the information that's been provided uh, by the department uh, on the Community Safety Board and framework. Or whether you require any more information. Really? Rachel Wage. Thanks, Chair. No, I have I have loads of questions on this, and I appreciate they're not here to you know in, in person. But I um, when I was on PCSP in council, the these this is the same membership as the PCSP is the DOJ PSNI Education Authority Housing Executive, and I know they're saying that they're not trying to duplicate existing work plans and associated actions, but this reads to me exactly like a PCSP. Another thing that annoyed me at PCSP is that the housing associations were not members of it, so we're dealing with issues brought by constituents or community groups and, or communities talking about issues that involve a housing association, and because the DOJ have said that it's only NIHE, we can't communicate with them. So I wonder why that membership has been chosen. Um, I would like to know what the difference is between this Community Safety Board and the PCSP, which we already fund. And if, it, if there's something wrong with the PCSP, fix that rather than, you know, I, maybe there's something fundamentally different. Um, and in terms of then the relationship with the PCSPs, which have the same membership, how, how is that going to, you know, how, how does that work fit in? Um, and finally, then, in terms of the Community Safety Board requesting the response group to be stood up to consider a spe specific issue, how, do, how does that happen? If there is a specific issue that is going on in a community, does, who, does somebody have to phone them? Or, you know, I, just, I just don't know how this works out in practice. So, I've, yeah, those are my questions on, on that, but maybe they are due for, for a different time whenever we have them in front of us. No, well, listen, I'm happy to, for these points to be raised and we can raise them with the department. Um, Linda? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with um, Rachel. Obviously, there's nobody here to respond to these um, issues today. I, I know that this was something that the Chief Constable was very keen on, and I suppose I'm not going to answer for them. I think they should come and answer for themselves, but I'm only thinking that in terms of the PCSP, where that's a local level. This is that, that level above that. So my concern around that is then where's the connection with the community because you know, everything should come bottom up. Mm -hmm. It's the only way it works. Where where the where it comes from bottom up, where it comes from the communities up to that. And they might well have devised a mechanism for doing that. So I, I suppose I'd like the information around that. So at some point and, and I'm, for me it's not something that has to happen. We have we have quite a 
heavy workload in, in the short term, but I do think that it would be valuable for us to get that detail at some point, and I agree with Rachel in relation to that. Okay, well, listen, let, let's raise it with the department in writing in the first instance. Um, you know, I think there are issues about potential duplication or indeed displacement of the work of PCSPs and um, getting reassurance about that. So if, let's in the first instance see what the response is and then the committee can um, take it forward. If we, if we need to have them come up, we can, we can bring them up in respect of that, um, but we'll, we'll write to them in the first instance. Okay. Um, item 11 then, pages 286 to 306, the department has provided information on a proposed private family law early resolution action plan that it's progressing jointly with the Department of Health. The aim of the plan is to improve outcomes for children and families by diverting parental disputes which do not require judicial adjudication away from court and supporting the early resolution of parental disputes which do come before the courts. The plan is envisaged as an evolutionary exercise with early actions informing decisions on how the departments might best support separating parents in the future. The Department has stated that initial actions are fairly modest but will be critical to the development of an evidence base in an area on which existing data is limited. Initial actions are focused on increasing awareness of options for resolving disputes and trialling tools to support the dispute resolution process. So the Justice and Health Ministers intend to launch the action plan before Christmas. The Department has indicated that it will engage further with the Committee on substantive actions such as the education programme and the media mediation pilot emerging from the action plan. So, again, members, if we're content uh, to note the proposed private family law early resolution action plan, unless there's more information needed, we're noted. Noted. <coughs> it's not a sore throat, members. It's all those particles <laughs> of um, disinfectant that's now floating around the room. So, maybe that's good for you. If you listen to yeah. Mr. Trump, he, he, he recommends that you <laughs> take some of these things. Um, I'm not so sure. Item 12, um, the five-year problem-solving justice strategy, pages 309 to 331. The department has provided a copy of its five-year problem-solving justice strategic plan, which it has developed to facilitate decisions regarding the rollout of those initiatives shown to be effective and determine the costs. The plan has been reviewed and updated to take account of the impact of COVID-19. The Department has highlighted that in light of the uncertainty around future budgets, it is too early to determine if the required funding will be available, and it recognises that there will be a need to prioritise what can be uh, delivered. Uh, one of the initiatives in the plan is support hubs, which the Committee has recently written to the Department about in the context of funding ceasing to be provided, the plan indicates. Uh, that support hubs are operating in 10 out of 11 operational areas, and a scoping study is underway for the final area, uh, which is Belfast. And a support hub steering group is also being set up according to the plan, based on feedback from stakeholders and the relatively small costs involved. It is recommended that support hubs should continue, and an evaluation should be carried out in 2020 21 to inform a review of services and the operation of funding uh, and, and the funding model. This appears. Uh, to be contrary to the decision to cease funding from the 30th of September that was outlined in correspondence uh, by the Head of Community Safety Vision and correspondence uh, to Mid and East Antrim uh, Borough Council. So, members, it's there um, for noting, um, unless there's more information that needs to be raised. Rachel Woods. Um, yes, Chair, thank you. I picked up on the support hubs and just wanted to confirm that it's the same support hubs that we were discussing not too long ago. So. Is one arm of DOJ cutting the funding, and the other is saying that it's a priority? Um, so I think we need to get some clarity on exactly what's happening with the support hubs, um, and why it would be a it would be something that would be in an initiative here, but not elsewhere. Um, and certainly, I think they should be ruled out further and not left to the councils to pick up the funding for. Um, everyone will know the dire situation that the councils are facing because of COVID and um, certainly if DOJ have been funding them so far at a minimal cost, I think they should continue. Linda? I would concur with what um, Rachel Woods has just said. I also um, just want to make the point that there is plenty of evidence to show that um, problem solving justice interventions produce better outcomes <coughs> and in the, in the medium and long term create savings. So 
on the back of what, what Rachel is saying, I would just like to clarify that the department does intend to put funding where there is evidence to show that, that, that it works. It works not only in saving money, but actually in better outcomes for the individuals themselves and for the wider community. So that's what we're supposed to be about. And I want to ensure that the department gives us some commitment around funding those problem solving problem can nearly get me round the <laughs> rounded problem solving justice. Um, I just I just would like to, some reassurance that there will be funding put in that direction because mm -hmm. it, it, it has been proven that it works and that there are good outcomes for everybody involved. So I I'd like some reassurance around that. Okay, back, well, I'll say it also. I agree and, and to me there's clearly a contradiction here within the department's position that um stop funding on the 30th of September, but they're recommending that this is actually worthwhile right. and minimal. So let, let's uh, raise this with the department and um, we'll question that and also ask for details on the assessment of the cost-benefit analysis on each project uh, in respect of this issue as well. Uh, if members are happy, then we'll, we'll do that. Item 13. Pages 333 to 359, the Department has provided a copy of the uh, Court and Tribunal Service Business Plan um, 2021, which was originally put on hold during the COVID-19 outbreak, but has now been agreed. The plan is dependent on the current situation and, if necessary, subject to further review and amendment throughout the year. The members, if we're content, will note the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service Business Plan for 2020-21. <coughs> Item 14, Draft Forward Work Programme, it's pages 361 to 371 of the meeting pack as the relevant papers. The Department has provided a list of items of business that it would like the Committee to consider. At the meetings in November, the Department is not yet in a position to confirm whether the evidence session on the committal bill will take place at our meeting on the 5th of November or whether it may need to be deferred until the meeting on the 12th of November. So if not deferred, currently there is uh, no oral evidence session scheduled uh, for the 12th of November, but we do have two written papers. I know the executive was meeting today, so there may have been progress in respect of the, the committal uh, reform bill. The minister did indicate to the deputy chair and I earlier this week that she had been seeking to advance that um, through the executive. So. There might be a more up-to-date position as a result of that. Um, so the minister um, is unable to attend the committee. As we, we have been asking to, to have some more engagement with the minister, um, but because the executive meets on a Thursday afternoon, then that's proven difficult. So arrangements have then been made for her to attend meetings on, and I know it's not ideal for members, but it's Tuesday the 3rd of November from 12.30 until 2 p.m. and on Tuesday the 15th of Dece December uh, the same time. So there's been a number of issues previously identified by members um, that uh, wish to discuss with the Minister and they're on pages 16 and 17 of the tabled pack. So those meetings are being scheduled uh, in advance of them, um, particularly the one on Tuesday the 3rd of November, um, just so that we have a, a complete kind of list. Members should indicate then to the clerk if there's anything more that we, we want to to be discussing and we'll try and space that out over those two um, proposed meeting dates. Um, okay, so if members are content, we'll schedule the work items that have been requested by the department for the meetings in November. And um, again, members of the department will be asked to provide an update on the position regarding those items on the list that it previously provided and had intended to bring to the committee between September. Uh, and December to enable the work programme to be finalised up to the Christmas uh, recess. <coughs> so if we don't have the committal briefing um, bill oral that's scheduled, um, then I think the committee, we, we do need to have an informal discussion on our own committee work priority. So if the committal bill oral session does take place, then we'll go ahead as planned on the 12th. If it doesn't, I was going to suggest that we can have uh, a more strategic conversation with ourselves about the committee's priorities um, before we're, we're burdened down again with more legislation. So we'll make provisional arrangement for that on the 12th of November, subject to what happens the committal bill. Um, correspondence, six items of correspondence, and I'll draw attention just to one of those items, and it was item four. Um, 
the response from the Minister of Justice providing further information on the protest in McGabry and Ash House uh, Women's uh, Prison, which has now come to an end. The Minister has indicated uh, that the protest had no impact on the running of either establishment or any member of prison staff, and the prison service is not aware of any detriment caused to the health of the prisoners involved. So members are asked to note the response from the Minister unless any more information is required. Noted. Um, and then just one item in the table pack. And the Minister has responded to the Committee's request for further information in respect of the two deaths of prisoners in McGabry that took place on the 18th and 20th of September. The Minister has outlined the protocol followed in relation to deaths in custody and has advised that given both are now subject to investigation, it isn't appropriate to provide any further information at this time. The Minister also advises that the wishes of the family of the deceased and their right to privacy will remain the prison service primary consideration in deciding how and when individual deaths should be communicated to the committee and states that it was regrettable that this information was placed on social media. The committee has written to the Minister to clarify the criteria used by the Department to, to determine when information should be provided to the committee and to explore an approach or protocol for informing the committee of incidents and important matters in a timely manner. So members were waiting on that response. Um, we have written um, to the minister in respect of that that is issued. Um, so we can pick that up whenever we get a response then from uh, the minister. So if members are content, we'll action then the other items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet. Okay. Um, and we're going to come into the, the, this session again because we're on the, the chairman's business. But um, I and the deputy chair had met with the minister on Tuesday. She had asked to meet with us just to discuss their legislative program for the rest of the mandate. Um, and the minister is still, she has told us, intending to bring forward the committal reform bill in November, the stocking bill before Christmas, and the miscellaneous provisions bill around March, April of next year. Um, and as we're now going to discuss again, um, the personal injury discount rate bill as well um, to, to the Assembly. So that's all of my Chairman's business. Um, is there any other business members want to raise and we can deal with AOB? Um, if not, then... Chair, just one thing, the COVID within the prisons. Do we have an update on, on the management of the COVID-19 within prisons? or What is the latest on that? Perhaps we could ask for an update on that, please. Yeah, the Minister had kept us updated, I suppose, whenever there was the, the initial um, increases within the medical team of the South Eastern Trusts, and, and we got regular updates. So we haven't had one of late, so we, we, we could ask for that. Um, okay. Right, thank you. Okay, members, so that's uh, all of the items on the agenda complete for today's business, but we do want to to go back then just to, to complete the evidence session that we here in person. had earlier. Um, on AOB. Oh yeah, yeah. So, um, so if members just want to refer back then to to your papers, it was pages 122 to 175. Um, from memory, Sinead Bradley had indicated that she wanted to come in, but can I first thank the officials for for making your way up? Um, hopefully, there was nothing too dramatic taking place down at uh, your. No. Your your buildings there, but uh, we appreciate you you coming up here. Now let's just hope the alarm bells don't start ringing in this building. Exactly. <laughs> um, so members, thank you. So I'm going to bring in Sinead Bradley, and then I'll bring in Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, and thank you for coming, not just your earlier presentation, but for going to the effort of coming back up. I really do appreciate it. Um, I suppose when I looked at this agenda item today, you know, there's a few things that maybe in of themselves are not a red flag, you know, but it's the cumulative effect of a lot of things that certainly do raise a flag in my mind in terms of our scrutiny role. So when you start with the conflict that the minister declared, which is the right thing to do if there's a conflict there, but then the um, irregular step in of the permanent secretary adding to that then a proposal to go against the mainstream of what the response to the consultation said compounds it further. Then there's a further compounding when you talk about accelerated passage 
you know, removing that scrutiny role from the committee, all on the basis of urgency. And I presume that's what this meeting is for today, is to communicate to us members what that urgency is to justify the need for that accelerated passage. Um, but what I don't want this to be is some sort of hurried attempt at us to try and grapple with the detail that I don't expect we're going to possibly get into in terms of um, weighing up the merits of the proposals one against the other. I just don't think it would do it credit to try to do that today. So, so really my two questions are this, I suppose, at this stage, I still don't feel I personally understand fully the urgency question, because you did refer to um, that there could be a backlog in the judiciary system, and you refer to um, the, current, the current rate that has been struck. Well, I presume that would continue until a commencement date of any new statutory discount rate is struck, so I don't understand why that wouldn't keep happening um, until a new commencement date happened. And I have no understanding of what the anticipated numbers are when you talk about backlog in the system. And the other question I have to ask, um, I appreciate that the department obviously want to work with the committee on all issues, but certainly in terms of bringing forward legislation in particular, but whilst you seek the consent of the committee, I want to know, is it a requirement? Thank you. Maybe if I could address the question first about why there would be a backlog since there is a current statutory discount rate. The current rate is 2.5%, which I think um, everyone, even insurance companies, would recognise as being uh, a bit on the high side. Therefore, if you are a claimant in a personal injury case, you will not want your case disposed of with a statutory discount rate of 2.5%. That would be to your material financial disadvantage. So you're going to want to wait to see what is the final settled rate, um, either a reviewed rate under Wells and Wells or a new rate set under a, a new legal framework. So you won't want to settle your case. Um, lawyers are unlikely to push cases into court until they know what the new rate is going to be. I can't honestly speak to the, the numbers of backlog. I know in um, 2019 there was something like 2,700 2, personal injury writs um, issued, but that, that's not to say you know there's going to be 2,700 cases backlog because those would be cases at the sort of very early stages of proceedings. But that just gives an indication of the number of sort of personal injury cases that would be um, taken out in the High Court on an annual basis. And uh, parties will either try and settle the case at something below the 2.5% uh, or else um, they will wait to see what the new rate is going to be. Because if you have a large personal injury case, I mean, if you have suffered some sort of catastrophic injury, and it, it looks likely that um, you will live for maybe 20, 30, 40 years, the personal injury rate will have a significant effect on the amount of your damages. So you're not going to want to take uh, a higher rate than you might have to if it is altered. So people are just waiting to see um, you know, where this ends up. Okay, thank you, Sinead, and um, thank you, Lauren. Um, Rachel Woods. Thank you, and um, thank you for coming up today. It's really it's much appreciated. This is a new area for me, um, I have to say, and um, it's taken a, a while to get my head around it, and I can't say, in all honesty, that I understand everything that's in that report, which is why I think that scrutiny time is quite important <laughs> for me personally. But whatever happens it has to be in the best interests of those who are entitled to the compensation, ensuring they get what they deserve. Um, so that needs to be front and centre. I'm not a fan of accelerated passage at all. I think we've made that clear throughout this last sort of six months. Um, it's been a common feature since February, unfortunately, from the executive, and I've, I've um, removed scrutiny any time. And as a non-executive party, it's very important for, for me to get adequate time um, on, on legislation. 
but she'd said about accelerated passage and if granted it could be laid in January, February and in place by September. But why the 78 months? Because accelerated passage can be done within 10 days. So I'm just wondering if that, because that's where we've, we've had accelerated passage from the executive ministers before this year. So why the 78 months? Um, I, also, I understand that in certain circumstances like urgent and emergency situations, accelerated passage could be justified. But understanding the urgency in this situation, I don't, and I appreciate your answers to earlier on, I'm not too sure what the exact urgency is. So is there a legal urgency? Does this not coming through an accelerated passage open the department up to a legal challenge, for example? Has there been any legal advice taken on that? And then I have another question just about the rates, but those are my two first two. Uh, well, even when there's accelerated passage, a, a bill is still going to have to go through the, the, the normal other assembly procedures, so consideration and, and further consideration. I know our colleagues in charge of the legislative programme have uh, assumed that royal, if it's introduced January, February, it would still take to royal assent, um, would take until September. But we can give you more detail on that and just actually the breakdown of the individual stages on the accelerated passage route. I certainly would appreciate that because it is my understanding that 10 days is the minimum that accelerated passage can be brought in. Um, I'm just reading it off the assembly website as well. So if there is why 78, no, it's, maybe it's because the legislative timetable is already booked out or wh whatever that is, but um, it says under accelerated passive procedure, a bill can pass all stages in as little as 10 days, but in no less time. The process skips committee stage, accelerated passive procedure requires cross community support in, within the meaning of the act. So I would certainly welcome a wee bit more information about why it could take up to eight months if it was laid in January. Yeah, well, we, we can write to you about that. Um, on, on the, um, just, just sorry for interrupting, but what you're saying is that the accelerated passage aspect of it, even though once the Assembly has approved this and completes final stage, you're saying that it's going to take until September for royal assent to be given to a bill that this Assembly passes in January? It would be introduced um, at the end of January or February, so it would still have to go through the other assembly stages. But those are all dealt with within the space of 10 days. That's the purpose of accelerated passage, so that a bill is introduced. It gets I think 10 days is the minimum possible time for accelerated passage, but that in, in this case, we're still envisaging that we would go through the full other procedures, the second stage, consideration stage, further consideration stage. And that has been planned out by our colleagues on the legislative programme. So you're going to introduce the bill in January, February, remove the committee scrutiny period, which we could take up to six months, but actually take longer than six months to complete final stage in September? But if the committee stage was in, then it would be an additional six months, and it's trying to manage that with the other bills? Addition, additional to what, sorry? If we have the committee stage, which would be up to six months, then we need to, to factor that in from the introduction in January, February to Royal Assent, September. That doesn't, that's, that's accelerated passage. It doesn't take any account of six months for committee scrutiny. That's not accurate. You're wrong. Who's advising you guys on, on the procedures of the Assembly? We will write to the committee on the way we thought this bill would be staged under accelerated passage and how we think it would be staged if accelerated passage wasn't available. We, we were trying to um, take into account the other legislation which would be before the committee. Okay, but really interested to get the advice that you're being given within the department as to the, the procedures of this assembly and where the committee fits into that, because what you're telling us just isn't accurate. It's, that's not the way that this, the assembly operates. Um, the, the, Rachel, sorry, you maybe hadn't finished. <laughs> okay. Sorry, just that, that sort of, it's feeding into to my question, to part of the question in terms of accelerated passage and the 10 days, that's five working weeks with two plenary days. 
in my head, but maybe I'm getting confused now as well, but that's, that was my understanding between introduction and royal assent. Um, so, I, yeah, definitely a wee bit more clarity on that um, and also would welcome whatever advice in terms of that. But our committee stage, yes, could be up to six months, but we've seen with the domestic abuse bill that we have done that in very, well, we did an immense amount of scrutiny in a very short space of time. So I'm, I'm, I understand that you might not have to factor up to six months in, but we can also do a committee stage in half that on a huge bill um, with, you know, as Linda was saying earlier on, a, a, a myriad of different, different aspects to it. Um, so in terms of just the legal advice, if there isn't, because I'm, I'm trying to figure out to see if, there, if there's another aspect of getting accelerated passage, does the is there any legal challenge? Could there be any legal challenge for not putting this through in this time? We're not aware of any legal challenge, but there's always um, the risk of a legal challenge, um, bearing in mind that the discount rate has been at the current level since 2001. So there could be legal challenge. So has the department? Um, got any legal advice on this? We have taken legal advice during the course of this process. And I, maybe I, I can't get that answer, but has the legal advice brought you to this conclusion? I think in the round, we think it is much preferable to have the new legislative framework in place as, as soon as possible in order to let a rate be set under the new framework. Chair, I don't know if this is procedure, if we're allowed to do a procedure. Can the committee request legal advice? It can, yeah. That's all my, that's, that's all my questions on procedure. I just have a question on the rate itself. I was trying to get my head around it. Where did the minus 1.75 come from? Scotland is minus 0.75. So if we're going down the Scottish model, where did the extra percentage point come from? And if possible, can someone explain this to me in layman's terms about <laughs> what this actually does? Uh, well, the reason um, our proposal for a change under the existing uh, legal framework was minus 1.75 is because it's, it's a different framework from the framework which applies in England and Wales and in Scotland. So in Northern Ireland, under the Wells and Wells case, the assumption is that a person would invest in index-linked gilts, which is a type of government bond, and it doesn't give a particularly good rate of return. But our legal framework requires us to assume that claimants are, are very risk-averse and therefore will invest in index link gilts. They are not performing well, uh, and it actually means, um, although they're, they're protected against inflation, you're not getting a good return on your money. So there's a rate of minus 1.75% in order to make sure your lump sum award retains its value for the, the life of the award. Um, Scotland and England and Wales have set up different arrangements so that the assumption is not that you invest solely in index link gilts, but that you will invest in a, a low risk diversified portfolio. So the Scottish portfolio, for example, assumes you will only invest 10% in index link gilts and you'll invest other percentages of your award in, in different investment products. And when the government actually applies that portfolio, it comes out uh, along with, with certain deductions for expenses and, and so on. It comes out at not point minus seven five. I need to look up what an index is. England and Wales, it's, it's minus not point two five. Okay. Um, and just in, I suppose in a practical term, so the investing in these in an in, in index link guilt, that is a mouthful. Um, do claimants have to invest in that? Is that part of the, whenever they get compensation? No, so no. I mean, that, that's, that's part of the problem. The, the statutory discount rate is based on the assumption 
that um, claimants will invest all of their award in index link gilts. Um, but there is no evidence that that is what is happening in reality. And the, the government actually has said to us, look, it's unlikely that, that anyone would invest all of their award in index linked gilts. So, sorry, this might be very stupid questions, but this, this change is being proposed for something that in reality doesn't happen? We have to set the discount rate on the assumption that people are investing in index link gilts because that meets the criteria in the Wells and Wells case. Uh, and, and what we want to do is move to a legal framework which we think um, is, is probably a more accurate reflection of how claimants properly advised would invest and that would be over um, a more diversified portfolio and that is what they have done in England and Wales and Scotland which is why they have different discount rates from us. Thank you. Okay, thank you Rachel. Um, Paul Frew and then Shania Bradley wanting to come back in and then Linda. Chair, just to lighten the mood and to offer sincere apologies to the, to the officials. I threw you a curveball of a question earlier on and sorry I don't know how I ended up on the wrong list. So apologies for that, because no you're worries. good, but you're not that good to answer a question like that. So apologies. Thank you, Paul. You're going soft. Yeah. Sinead Bra Bradley. <laughs> I'm glad that's recorded. Hands up. Thank you, Chair. Chair, um, I would love, like Rachel, I don't think in that detail of all these assumptions that are made about, you know, what's invested and how wisely people might use their money or not use their money and when it's spent up you know it becomes an extra um cost to the public purse and we want certainty for people who have an entitlement certainly under this but what i still don't understand and forgive me for going back over this because i think the question in front of us today as a committee is do we agree to accelerated passage and the argument that i've heard so far that there is this, the, the reason for accelerated passage is that there's this building backlog within the system of people who are hesitant to settle their claim because there's uncertainty around this issue. And that's why we need to do this. But when I ask the question then about numbers or how big is that, you know, um, within the system, there doesn't appear to be any evidence how, how our, our scale of the size and also I want to go back to the question um, is it a requirement I said that the minister would love to work with the committee I don't doubt that and I don't doubt everybody on this committee would want to ensure anybody who's due compensation gets it swiftly and at a fair rate but I need to understand why why the urgency to do this well, I, I do have a letter from the Association of Personal um, Injury Lawyers who would represent um, personal injury claimants, and uh, they have said that settlements um, in the majority are on hold. Now, I don't have numbers. I don't know if I could get numbers from April, but it stands to reason that if, if you were a personal injury claimant, you would want the, the most advantageous statutory discount rate applied to your settlement. And you would know all of this debate is going on, and there is a lot of interest in are we going to legislate or are we going to change the rate or what are we going to do? So people are really waiting for the music to stop before they decide whether to settle their case or run it or whatever. The other issue, as was mentioned, is um, the impact this might have on you know, other bills within the, the uh, legislative programme, particularly the, the miscellaneous provisions bill. But uh, I've heard what the committee says about you know, the, the programming of legislation, and we'll go back to colleagues and see um, have we got the, the formulation correct. Okay, thanks, thanks Sinead. Right. Linda, uh, oh, sorry, Sinead. And the requirement, well, I know they're looking the consent of the committee for accelerated passage can the minister continue without it 
So I can answer that for you, Sinead. And no, under the relevant standing order 42, the Minister would need to get cross-community support in the Assembly to proceed through accelerated passage route. So it, this isn't in the gift of the Minister if she decided to, sue, to, to, to take that route. I think the, the Minister has to come to this committee as well. It's, it's not a decision I think the committee has been asked to make today. No. Uh, no, that's right. It's, it, 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 it requires, under that standing order, uh, where exceptionally a bill is thought to require accelerated passage, which shall exclude any committee stage, the member in charge of the bill, in this case it would be the Minister, um, shall before introduction of the bill in the Assembly explain to the appropriate committee the reasons for, and it, it then indicates that before second stage in the Assembly chamber, the member in charge shall move a motion that the bill proceed under accelerated passage procedure. So. The Minister would need to come to this committee to provide an explanation. Uh, the committee still at that stage does not have a, a veto in that respect, but it then goes into the Assembly Chamber, um, and then Assembly members would, would decide whether or not to grant accelerated passage. That would be a decision, ultimately, that the Minister could take. Um, but yes, it is for members to, to vote on it eventually. Linda? Thank you, Chair. I suppose just to agree actions going forward. I think that we should get some detail, to be fair, from procedures rather than from DOJ, because the procedures in, in the Assembly is not the speciality of, of, of the officials in DOJ, but, but, we, but we need to know. We need that information. Um, and then I would just say to, I suppose to yourselves, as the officials come back to the Department, and I think the Chair has said this, but just to, to, to be clear, and I think I'm speaking on behalf of the Committee, and if I'm not, you have made dissent quickly. Um, work out what the department can do in terms of bringing the legislation to us. We will work out what we can do. The department does not need to worry about, what, about the committee. We will we'll work that out and, and we will be straight with you as how, you know, how timely can we bring it through. But I, I would say that if acceleration pa accelerated passage is not the route, that this committee would certainly endeavour, I believe, to make it as speedy a process as possible. It is a very narrow piece of legislation and therefore um, I think that we, we would just and I'm not sure whether I just wanted to respond to a question that Rachel had actually asked. So around the, the discount rate, whether they invest or not, the discount happens. So that's that's why the rate needs to, to be looked at because I, I have struggled with this, I can I can tell you. This, this has been in, in committee papers for a, a number of occasions now, and it's probably only this time that I've fully got to grips with it, to, to be fair. So it, it is difficult to get our heads around it. But the rate, I suppose, is not our concern, but the framework is. It is, yeah. And that's all of the arguments that we've heard. There is, a, there is an immediate immediacy about this. I know from a constituent who has been left paralysed is waiting and has been asking, when is this rate getting changed? And I don't think the rate is currently fair. I have to set that aside, because once this framework's in, that's the framework, and that'll be the decision as to how you get the rate, and that'll then, for future years. Um, so there is a, an immediacy to this, but there's also a medium to long-term implication. Can I just ask, the, the Scottish model... Um, they indicated what they believed the cost to be, but has there has there been an analysis of what they believed the costs would be and, and what it is now transpired to be? In Scotland? Yes. Uh, I don't know. I, I honestly I can't, I can't the, answer that. The, I can't think. the issues to consider in all of this, um, one is the the victim that requires to have fair compensation. The other is then medical practitioners, dentist practices, which obviously is where the minister's conflict is, all need to be able to get adequate insurance. And if you have a departure from the insurance industry of people that are going to provide cover, then that's going to increase the costs to public sector when it comes to the Department of Health. So that's the kind of rounded view that people are trying to struggle with, because obviously if you push up premiums, then you're going to potentially drive people out of providing services, and then that isn't beneficial to the wider public. So it's, I accept all of this is quite difficult, um, and there needs to be a considered view taken on it. And that's just why I'm, I'm struggling to, 
identify the need for the accelerated passage route. But um, I, I've teased the issue out enough in my own mind just at this stage. Um, I, in terms of any further questions, I don't, I don't have any more. Has, has anyone else any further questions just of the folks here? No, well, listen, thank you for, for coming up um, from, from down You're below. You're very welcome. I oh, appreciate that, so thank you. Thank you. You had to get out and you, and you didn't take it for a few days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, members, we'll just discuss this in a moment and then that'll conclude. Thank you. See you now. Thank you. All the best. Okay, members. Um, so, from a from a procedural point of view, uh, it is for the minister to decide if she wants to take accelerated passage, and um, that would then come as the relevant standing order indicates. Uh, the minister coming to this committee to explain that, but ultimately it would go into the assembly. Now I know members of the finance committee are probably more um, used to what accelerated passage means, and and it's not something I actually ever had to deal with as an MLA on a committee that I sat on, because it was usually only ever the preserve of um, very few committees, finance usually being one of them. So it, it's not something that I'm overly familiar with in my ten years of being in this place. Um, so. Members aren't being asked at this stage um, to indicate, I suppose, whether or not you agree with accelerated passage, um, but we can flag up to the department um, if there's a, a number of concerns. I, I, I would like to find the evidence or the, the what advice has been given to the minister that she has had to recuse herself to this extent that she's now handed over the policy decision-making process um, to the permanent secretary because under questioning, there's n this is the first time that's happened. Mm -hmm. you know, there is no, there hasn't been another example. So a precedent is being set, um, and I think it's always important when a precedent is set by a minister um, that we understand what the basis of that is, um, and the the advice that has been given to the minister in respect of that. So I would want in the, the letter that will go to the department that we get all of the information that has came to the conclusion reached by the Minister that she's had to do this, and the issues raised about the Permanent Secretary, um, and if this is an appropriate rule for the Permanent Secretary to have, what other alternatives were there? Um, you know, was this something that uh, a minister, another minister in another department should now be given the responsibility for? Um, I suspect that's not legally something that's possible, but uh, and it's not fair to compare it to a minister that can't appear in the chamber to ask questions. Another minister could answer, um, you know, but that's the kind of thing that happens in this in this place that other ministers can't deputise. Was this something that should have been considered legally to give out the responsibility for to another minister? Um, so there's questions around that, um, and. The other issue here, this was meant to be in the miscellaneous provisions bill, so this was going to be subject to proper legislative scrutiny whenever that bill came forward. They now want to take this out of it as a separate bill, but then use accelerated passage uh, in order to do it, but based on their own time frame, actually not have it finalised until after potentially the miscellaneous provisions bill could have been dealt with if they introduced that in March. So there's a lot of questions as to why they have taken it out of that process and then don't want to give this committee its scrutiny rule that I'm still not convinced about. Urgency is the other one members have struggled to, to understand. Um, and, and yes, there's always a potential legal challenge, and I'm no legal expert. But usually courts are very reluctant to interfere when a, when a legislature is in the process of actually addressing a problem because there's ongoing deliberation and a court and that's all that's usually a very strong defense for a department and a government to say we are now seeking to remedy the issue that we are being challenged upon and courts very rarely ever will intervene in that stage it's only at the point of a decision that was a, that was a question i was going to ask but i knew it was unfair to ask it of them because they, they wouldn't yeah. be able to give that 
that kind of information but I agree and I think that any judge that would be looking at it and considering how long would it take for the legal process and how long is it going to take for the legislation to be completed and I mean that they'd have to weigh that up and say is this particularly if it was somebody who was getting legal aid yeah they'd have to weigh that up and say is this value for money is this good for the public purse I mean all of those things would have to be taken into consideration so if members are content around those points, we'll write back and we'll indicate that at this stage the committee hasn't been convinced um, of the merits of the accelerated passage route um, and then ask these questions um, that we'll seek answers to. Sinead Bradley. Yes, sorry Judy, just to, um, to support a lot of what you said there, but I, I really want to get a better measure of how proportionate is this. You know, accelerated passage is a quite an extreme tool for any minister to reach to use, but to do it under such circumstances where she knows she has to delegate. And again, and I take your point um, about your constituent, and I do know of cases, but with all due respect, we have to measure what is the weight of those cases. Of course, everybody wants anybody who has an entitlement to receive that and to receive a fair one. But is there such a significant number within the system at this point in time to justify it being proportionate for a minister to use accelerated passage. Yeah, and I suppose I on sure, just on the back of Sinead's point, I would also like to be sure that this is about the injured parties and not about their legal representatives who obviously are paid on the basis of what their client gets. Um, so I, I think that you know that's generally a percentage of what their what their client gets. So I, I would have concerns around that because I, w I wonder in reality how many injured parties actually know anything about, or even if they did understand what the, this rate is about or what it means. Their legal representatives would absolutely understand it, but do they? I'm not so sure. Yeah, and j just to to complete on that point. Um, I'm not sure which member it was that raised it, but w what we're being asked to do is change the legal framework that sets the rate. This committee doesn't set the rate, so we need to be satisfied that the legal framework and the systems are appropriate. What the actual rate is is not a matter for this committee, mm -hmm. but there's nothing stopping the department from changing the rate under current legal framework. What they're saying is here is that the interim rate that they could use, they're not going to use because they want to change the legal framework. So if there was such an imperative to deal with the current cases, the department could change the rate now and introduce an interim rate. It's choosing not to do that because it wants to change the legal framework. So that's why I'm not convinced about the argument that we need to move through this process in order to address the issue on behalf of victims, because the department could take that unilateral action if that was the driving force. Um, Okay, so members, we'll, we'll, we'll raise these issues then with the department. Um, it would be interesting just to see how they, they come back to it. Um, and we can take advice then uh, subsequent to that. I know Rachel had mentioned getting her own independent legal advice. That's always available to us from the Assembly's legal services team, but I don't think we're at that point yet. Um, there's a very clear procedural route that out, that's outlined in standing orders that need to be followed, and the role of MLA is to consent or otherwise to that. But let's hear back from the department in respect to the issues then that we're going to raise. Okay, so members, there's nothing else because that's the, the business concluded. We're due to meet again on the 5th of November, 2 o'clock in room 30. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.